welcome again. I am sure you must have uh, found the poem that I gave in the last class uh, uh, a remarkable uh, uh, you know it must have given you an extraordinary experience because uh, the poem has the capacity to align us onto some extraordinary things some you know eco friendly things. Uh, that is the reason why I give you that poem. Of course, uh, when we give you these kind of poems as assignment, they serve uh, not just one purpose, uh, multiple purposes. Of course, the apparent uh, reason was to uh, make you identify the different figures of speech that you learnt uh, in the class. But more than that, of course, uh, you know if you read that, uh, if you read that particular poem, The Heart of the Tree you would be coming uh, face to face with a remarkable poem that has every ability to spark or ignite in us uh, an immense love for nature you know. So, that is the benefit of uh, uh, you know reading poetry because uh, we are in the presence of uh, 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 you know fire uh, a fire that is uh, alive and kicking. So, when you touch it well it has the capacity to burners you know when I say burn not in a negative sense uh, it can destroy the impurities and uh, you know it can create as a fresh you know. So, in that sense uh, by reading poetry we become twice born because uh, the first time we read it it kills all the impurities in us and therefore, we are born again afresh probably in the ideals that humanity needs to practice you know you can call it you know uh, by reading literature I become twice born. All right. Uh, in this class uh, we are going to discuss because it is a class or a week on uh, poetry we will have to cover different aspects of poetry different movements of poetry different uh, sensibilities of uh, poetry. That is the reason why we began this week with uh, an active discussion of uh, various elements of poetry, different figures of speech you know that propel poetry you know that act as a kind of kind of a driving force behind poetry you know. In other words uh, uh, like if you look at uh, look at it as a kind of a metaphor if you look at uh, poetry if you can compare poetry to an electronic gadget you know these things act as a kind of a, a CPU you know if you compare poetry to a system a computer probably various figures of speech can be act uh, I mean you can it is the it is the system that powers up the whole thing right. So, you can call it a, a CPU or something like that. So, having uh, understood various elements of poetry now uh, we move on to discussing uh, poetry. Uh, now, as part of that we begin with an understanding of English poetry you know British poetry, poetry written uh, uh, in uh, Britain in, in English. So, we have already discussed origins of poetry across the globe in one of the earlier classes ok. So, in today's class we are going to discuss origins of poetry English poetry the origins of uh, English poetry as such and uh, in the process we wish to take you through to Elizabethan poetry and even a little later than that until metaphysical poetry if time permits ok. Yeah. Uh, like uh, poetry elsewhere English poetry too has its origins you know uh, in folk you know it has a folk element to it therefore, it was uh, used for narration it was used for performance therefore, it has a narrative and performative dimension to it. Of course, that we discussed poetry across the globe during its uh, initial phase you know it was not meant to be written it was meant to be narrated it was meant to be performed sung and all that. So, English poetry is no exception to that. English poetry uh, old English poetry of course, it is called so called Anglo Saxon poetry. Uh, Unfortunately, we do not have uh, many of them many of uh, those poems though we find references to some of these poems uh, being written we do not have access to them unfortunately uh, 
uh, we have lost them to history you know only a few of them have survived and so we discuss those surviving pieces here. One of the problems uh, we encounter when we discuss uh, uh, old English poetry of course, it is something similar to you know old uh, ancient Indian uh, poetry, ancient Greek poetry as well is that you know we do not know the exact uh, authorship, date and the background when these things were composed that is a common problem you know in textual editing uh, you know uh, that is a common problem that we face. And if we can list out some general characteristic features of uh, these uh, you know various pieces, well they have a paganistic origin you know a, a free worship of nature paganistic you know and highly religious as well because the tone is religious. We have always said that poetry when it uh, began it, it began as a part of a religious uh, you know ceremonies that is why most of our in, in India the Vedic hymns you know they are part of uh, various religious rituals and even in um, uh, Egypt you know we discussed the pyramid text remember how they are part of various uh, rituals especially rituals related to death and all that you know. So, even here they are part of uh, various religious rituals and all that love songs all these things are a part of uh, old English poetry. If you look at uh, uh, the form well generally speaking they have the her I mean you know uh, heroic epics you know elegies and heroic epics we discuss them these subtypes of poetry please recall what elegies stand for you know sad songs. Uh, songs that are meant to mourn somebody close to you and all that. So, these are something. The moment we say old English poetry what comes to our mind is the first uh, epic that we see in British poetry it is called Beowulf. Beowulf is the most influential and popular English epic though there are a couple of poems that uh, predate this they do not match uh, Beowulf in terms of its grandeur, beauty, style, language and diction. Therefore, you have every right to call Beowulf the first major uh, literary work in English you know especially old English poetry. Uh, if you recall uh, in 2007 right yeah in 2007 uh, you also uh, must have uh, you know seen a movie based on uh, the epic that we are about to discuss now you know Robert Zimerex uh, has uh, you know brought this poetry onto a celluloid uh, uh, medium in an extraordinary way in a very epic way. So, this uh, rendition is also equally beautiful you know 2007 that movie is uh, based on uh, this particular epic the first uh, English epic. Uh, it is a heroic poem and like all other uh, epics it makes use of uh, you know heroic poetry uh, genre. So, it is uh, based on a continental Germanic theme ok. So, roughly speaking it has about 3200 lines. So, you can call Beowulf uh, approximately you know it is about 3200 uh, alliterative uh, lines. We do not know uh, the exact uh, date of its composition, authorship uh, you know and all that. So, we can call it a folk epic, we can call it a folk epic. The poem is named after this epic is named after Beowulf uh, an eponymous uh, Scandinavian hero uh, and his uh, heroic deeds. Uh, that. Uh, historians believed uh, may have happened during 6th century AD you know. Uh, remember uh, some of our ancient uh, poetry they also serve as historical pieces you know through poetry our history was transmitted before you know uh, history as uh, a particular uh, mm, uh, subject or discipline of knowledge you know began we had poetry serving uh, the purpose of that poetry almost double doubled up as uh, an historical work as well. 
uh, to a certain extent right. So, this is it. Generally speaking, uh, the, the poem begins in Denmark, where uh, Beowulf uh, visits to support uh, a king, the king of Danes, because uh, his kingdom was uh, you know uh, troubled by uh, a monster called Grendel and uh, Grendel's mother kind of dragons. So, Beowulf has been uh, uh, called in to help the king and Beowulf successfully uh, you know kills uh, Grendel and of course, later uh, Grendel's mother uh, vows to take revenge and uh, he has to encounter Grendel's mother as well that was a part of the epic. So, this is uh, in a nutshell the heroic adventure of Beowulf and his encounter with uh, Grendel and Grendel's mother. And later of course, the epic goes on to recount how Beowulf himself uh, becomes a king and the kind of problems he encounters and uh, later you know uh, while uh, fighting with uh, another dragon uh, he does not uh, you know he does not succeed in that he dies it is a kind of a, a tragic epic. So, this is uh, you know Beowulf uh, in a nutshell for you. Uh, from uh, Beowulf, if we can come to you know the earliest known writers, these are some of the well known earliest uh, writers we have in English poetry, you know, Cadman and uh, Cinewolf. Uh, especially Cadman's hymn is his only surviving work, but we find references to his other works uh, in this work, that is how we know he has written. Uh, more than hymns you know. And uh, uh, this poem is written in praise of or in the honor of God. So, it is a kind of a religious song extolling the virtues of God and all that as the title itself suggests you know it is composed uh, in praise of God. Cinewolf is uh, another poet you know approximately you know he seemed to uh, be 9th century you know 9th century. Uh, religious poetry again he is the author of uh, religious poetry. We have uh, you know four poems that are available to us the fate of uh, the apostles. In fact, this uh, the stone edict that you see is uh, from that from there you know please see this stone edict. Juliana, Eileen and the Christ the second it is also called the ascension these are his uh, known works, these are his known works. So, in other words, uh, these two names are significant because they are you know the earliest uh, known English poets, roughly speaking, uh, something uh, you know somewhere about 8th and 9th century AD. From here, we move on to middle English poetry. You know, when we say middle English poetry, something uh, you know after 13th and 14th century somewhere in that uh, way you know from generally speaking a study of English literature is uh, you know when classifying English literature we say from uh, its origin until through 12th and 13th century it is called old English from 13th century onwards especially early 14th century onwards it is middle English and all this ok. So, this is middle English. Uh, generally speaking uh, middle English poetry displays uh, 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 a heavy influence of Latin and French literature all right. However, it has not given up medieval uh, the middle English poetry has not altogether lost touch with uh, the old English poetry we still find it we still find remnants of old English poetry may be in uh, uh, structural terms if not in thematic way at least structurally speaking because you find you come across uh, the same alliterative verses, religious verses uh, composed in a particular style stylistically speaking you find uh, traces of uh, the old English uh, poetry as well. But by then Latin and French literatures have begun casting their influence. So, you find uh, a combination of all these uh, influences when you come to the middle English poetry. And uh, well, uh, it is not until late or it is not until let us say late 15th century and early 16th century that you uh, 
uh, come across uh, the advent of other uh, forms of literature or other genres of literature. So, poetry is still the only preferred uh, uh, form of literature in the middle English poetry as well. Uh, as I said, uh, the same religious themes, themes related to love, heroic adventures, they continue the scene. So, these are some, uh, uh, you know, some minor writers before we come to a major writer, 14th century produces the first major English poet. Before we come to him, we need to know, you know, some of his precursors. These are some of his precursors. The major English poet that we referred to just a while ago was Chaucer. But before we discuss Chaucer and his importance, of course, these are some of his earlier uh, predecessors, you can call them, who, uh, what do you call, who, who pitched the ground, you know, who paved the ground, who paved the way for him. So, you have Lazaman and his work Brat, you have Robert of Gloucester and you have uh, Robert Manning of, uh, you know, Brun. These are some of, uh, uh, you know, the early writers in the middle uh, English poetry. So, something in uh, early 13th century and 14th century. So, in Brut, it deals with, uh, you know, the history of uh, uh, Brutus uh, from the time he lands into, you know, Britain to his death, you know. So, it is uh, it's composed uh, in 16,000 alliterative lines, something like this. But from here, we basically need to come to, you know, Chaucer. Chaucer is a very important uh, figure for us, you know. Before we come to Chaucer, these are some of the works that are available to us. I quickly go through it, just take a look at it, you know. Uh, the Owl and the Nightingale, uh, the Cursor Mundi, Ormulum, and uh, these are some other ones, you know. Pearl, Purity, Patience, you know, Guy of Warwick, King Horn. Have look of uh, have look the dawn, but more than all these things, what draws my attention and what I would like to draw your attention as well towards you know Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. This is uh, another uh, well-known uh, you know poetic work, almost uh, you can call it a semi-epic you know uh, a semi-epic kind of an, uh, a work, alliterative, and it deals with a particular. Uh, genre of uh, romance poetry, it is called, it belongs to the genre called, uh, you know, chivalrous romance, chivalrous romance, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Well, uh, here is a very interesting thing, you know, just a month ago, uh, uh, a movie has come out, you know, a movie has uh, come out on this uh, folk, folkish uh, epic as well. Gawain and the Green Knight. It is called The Green Knight. Came out uh, just a few weeks ago or maybe a month ago. Directed by David Lowry and uh, you know Dave Patel in one of the lead characters in one of the lead roles. It depicts, it is based on the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, again, uh, a, a celluloid epic, you can call this The Green Knight, a celluloid epic. Uh, a beautiful rendition. Please remember, we call such renditions as intersemiotic translations. It is an interesting aside, you know. Translation, it is a kind of a translation because you translate uh, uh, a work written into uh, a celluloid medium. So, it is a kind of an intersemiotic one because the medium of translation is different, you know. From the print to the celluloid, it is a different medium. So, this kind of translation is called an intersemiotic I mean, inter uh, translation. It has uh, its own constraints uh, to translate a work written uh, here into, you know, bringing it onto a screen or onto a stage. It requires a lot of sacrifices, a lot of constraints. Nevertheless, uh, it is a, a, a wonderful attempt by the director. So, you can even watch it if you want to know what this epic is all about. You can as well watch the movie, you know. Uh, in Middle English, uh, undoubtedly Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is uh, one of the finest uh, romances, you know, and as I said, it belongs to the genre called chivalric romance, chivalric romance. 
again it deals with uh, the heroic adventures of uh, a knight called Goin and uh, his battle with a mysterious knight called the Green Knight you know. You have lot of uh, you know folk themes here what has happened uh, there is a, a mysterious knight appears and uh, he almost defeats everybody. But what happens Sir Goin who is a, a, a valiant knight uh, challenges him and he almost uh, in the duel he kills Green Knight you know he beheads him. And uh, strangely after losing his head you know Green Knight uh, after a while he gets up picks his head back places it uh, and says remember this fight is not yet over and disappears. And, uh, he the, I mean another date for uh, the fight is set maybe I mean about a year after you know. So, then Sir Goyens how does he tackle the green knight how does he prepare all these things forms they, it forms the crux of this particular epic you know a very beautiful uh, one. Of course, uh, remember when we are reading if at all we attempt to read uh, old English poetry or middle English poetry we may come across uh, it may even at structurally speaking it may sound I mean it may look a little strange because you have lot many characters that you and I do not use in English today you know. So, there is a presence of lot many characters so and even language is slightly you know removed. So, all these possibilities are there. So, nevertheless uh, that these are things that we have to keep in mind ok. From uh, the Green Knight we move on to Geoffrey uh, Chaucer. Geoffrey Chaucer is called and rightfully so the father of English literature the father of uh, English poetry because he is a the first major English poet of course, though the earliest English poets uh, that credit goes to someone else Chaucer is uh, the best one of the best English poets the first best English uh, you know poet you can call. Uh, therefore, rightly he is called the father of English poetry. Uh, he has uh, several works to his credit, but before we uh, discuss we need to know that uh, you know his uh, uh, poems are divided into three stages French, Italian and English. He was a scholar in fact, he was a scholar also worked in the court in some capacity in a, some diplomatic capacity therefore, he was well versed with uh, many languages. So, he has his writings in English as well. So, because of his uh, sheer uh, you know uh, ability to use words because of his narrative capabilities and the effortless ease with which he introduces humor he stands out Chaucer stands out as uh, one of the preeminent poets in uh, English poetry and he also has to his credit you know uh, introduction of uh, you know decasyllabic line from France to England you know 10 syllables. Uh, meter rhyme and rhythm again you know they are too technical for us and probably maybe we can discuss them uh, in another course. Uh, but they are a part of uh, they are technical part of uh, English uh, literature, but for time being you can call it you know decas he is he is uh, credited to have brought in a decasyllabic uh, line a 10 syllable uh, lines from France to England. Because of course, because of his uh, vast exposure uh, to French literature as well. And again uh, uh, the seven line stanza uh, with a rhyme scheme of uh, A B A B B C C, a kind of uh, you know A B A B B C C, uh, a seven line stanza is again attributed to Chaucer, and uh, this particular rhyme scheme when you use it, uh, this particular rhyme scheme in your poetry, it's called a Chaucerian uh, you know rhyme scheme, or you can even call it rhyme royal you know rhyme royal that is his uh, contribution to English poetry as such. When it comes to his works you know he has extraordinary works in fact, uh, all of them are available to us fortunately we have them and uh, some of them are even available to us in modern English. As I said you know we may not be able to read uh, 
uh, the works the way he has uh, written because as I said you know uh, that language is slightly different you and I may not be familiar with it. Fortunately, most of them have uh, you know been retranslated into modern English therefore, nothing should prevent us from reading his works. Especially I want you to draw uh, I want to draw your attention towards the Canterbury Tales you know the Canterbury Tales one of the finest narrative verses written in English you know the Canterbury Tales recounts uh, 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 on their you know it is a kind of a pilgrimage tale on their uh, way to Canterbury uh, many of the pilgrims uh, you know they stay at a place and start recounting their tales you know their life and everything. So, a kind of it gives you uh, especially if you want to get a kind of an anthropological understanding of uh, you know England at that particular point of time. Uh, this work particularly helps us because it gives us a glimpse into a cross section of uh, the British society at that particular time Canterbury Tales. You also have the Parliament of Fowls another uh, uh, you know uh, very interesting uh, dream vision kind of a poem uh, which is dedicated to uh, you know Saint Valentine. Uh, on a Saint Valentine's Day probably for a performance during the Saint Valentine's Day it must have been composed. The Parliament of Fowls and Book of the Duchess, the Trilus and Cressida too, the Trilus and Cressida, the Legend of Good Women. So, these are some of his uh, remarkable uh, works of course, what I have on, uh, on my uh, left uh, hand side is uh, you know to your right hand side you know a painting of it and maybe an excerpt from uh, uh, one of his uh, tales you can just take a look at it out of historical curiosity all right. Yeah, From Chaucer we move on to some of uh, Chaucer's contemporaries uh, well uh, notable contemporaries you can say if not uh, equal in merit, but of course uh, they have uh, their contributions to English literature too. William Langland especially Piers the Plowman, Piers the Plowman his, uh, uh, his very well known work William Langland the vision of William concerning Piers the Plowman, where uh, you know he critiques uh, the visors and foibles of the church. In fact, it is a it is a powerful poetic critique of religion you know a powerful poetic critique of the religion. So, as opposed to that he brings forth uh, the virtues, the struggles and the beauty of the common people you know. He elevates uh, the struggles of the common people to the level of uh, you know uh, a beautiful epic uh, in his work especially Piers the Plowman. We have John Gore you know Confessio Amantis his well known work. Uh, again it is set in an allegorical uh, context you know. And uh, it talks about uh, the seven deadly sins and illustrated by several anecdotes a very very interesting one as well. These are of course, uh, historically significant works you know. And you have uh, John Berber these are some of uh, the well known uh, contemporaries of uh, uh, Chaucer. So, before we wind up this class uh, let us quickly recall what we did in this class. Uh, we discussed uh, the early origins of uh, English poetry you know somewhere how it began in 8th century, 9th century the first uh, uh, English poets we came face to face with uh, them we familiarized ourselves with uh, their concerns and themes and how the poetry at that point of time is uh, religious uh, and heroic. And then we discussed uh, Beowulf especially Beowulf uh, you know how uh, that is a remarkable uh, epic you know folk epic that discusses the adventures of Beowulf in a, in a beautiful metrically uh, well composed lines. We discussed uh, another important uh, semi epic you can call them you know uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And then from there we came across uh, you know Geoffrey Chaucer his contribution to English poetry and how he is rightly called the father of English poetry and later of course, some of uh, the well known uh, Chaucer's contemporaries uh, you know. In the next class uh, 
we are going to discuss English poetry post uh, uh, Chaucer's period, especially 15th century onwards. All right. Until then, uh, keep recalling some of the important points that we have discussed and we will meet you in the next class. Thank you.